Okay, well, it is now um, three o'clock, so I'm going to get us started here. Um, once again, uh, a, a huge thanks for, for anyone who is joining us uh, from anywhere in the world. You probably just heard us reading out the names of all the people, um, all the places that, that we have people watching this session. Um, this is one of the biggest ever um, sessions that, that, that I've run for theoryofknowledge.net. Um, which I think indicates how important um, what we're talking about today uh, is uh, around the world and, and, and the importance that you, that you sort of agree that it has for our young people. Um, so I have um, three wonderful people who are joining me today for this, for this webinar. Um, and I'd just quickly like to introduce them before we start talking. Um, so first of all, we have Julie Bogart, who is a thought leader in alternative education, as she puts it, um, particularly homeschooling. She brought up her own children, um, homeschooled them. Uh, she runs a company called Brave Writer. Uh, she, te she teaches a, a very innovative approach to, to writing and critical thinking instruction. And she's written two brilliant books, um, Raising Critical Thinkers, A Parent's Guide to Growing uh, Wise Kids in the Digital Age was the, the most recent. Uh, there it is. Um, we we're just talking about self-promotion, but that's great. Um, and she has worked with students in about 191 countries uh, and has taught, as she calculated, over 100,000 families. And she has a very popular podcast called Brave Writer, um, which deals with writing, education, parenting, and thinking. And she's great fun to talk to. So she is our first guest. Um, we have Sarah Kupke, who is the head of professional learning at ECIS. If you're not familiar, ECIS is the Educational Collaborative for International Schools. And it's a brilliant organization for all of us who are involved in international education. Uh, she's worked as a head in um, international schools around the world. Um, she has led teams who have developed innovative dual language and interlingual approaches to learning and language development. She's worked in the UK, she's worked in Germany, she's worked in primary, secondary, special education and undergraduate education, uh, and she's now based uh, in Germany. Um, Andrew is um, the head of secondary at uh, Newton College in Peru. Um, which is an international um, IB continuum school. So it offers PYP, the MYP, and the DP. And he himself was kind of the driving force uh, behind the MYP, even though he's the most modest person in the world and never uh, claims any credit for any of these, these things. I worked with him in Lima, and he's a, he's a, he was a brilliant colleague and a very good friend. Uh, he's done things outside of the school as well. He's He's worked in the US, he's worked abroad, he's advised the World Bank, he's advised the Peruvian Ministry of Education, so he's an all-round uh, educational guru and genius. Um, so we have three wonderful people. I'm Michael Dunn, if you're not familiar with me, I'm the creator of theoryofknowledge.net, uh, which is the world's biggest online resource for the TOK course, uh, and we will shortly be launching another website called Thinking Hub. Dot org, which will be designed for non-IB schools to help them uh, develop their critical thinking. Um, so our topic today is, is critical thinking. Um, it is all about how to encourage critical thinking, how to, um, to, to encourage students to, to, to become critical thinkers rather than stifle what we see as their innate critical thinking skills. Um, and we would like to just share with you our thoughts and our, our feelings about why this is important and what it is. And that's where I really want to start, because we hear so much about critical thinking. We hear schools claim to be hubs of critical thinking. But I think often when you ask people what critical thinking is, they kind of pause and hesitate. And actually, they haven't got a clear answer. For me as a teacher, that's often a problem because that means the students themselves don't really know what critical thinking is. So can we start with that? Um, what do we, what, how would we define critical thinking? Um, and, and I think as a sort of adjunct to that, why is it so important right now to be talking about critical thinking? So Julie, can we start with you? How, how do you define critical thinking? Yeah, thank you, Michael. It's so good to be here. Um, for me, so often critical thinking is held up as the ability to notice the flaws in the other person's argument. So we're listening to a television pundit or we're talking to a relative and we think I'm doing a good job of critically thinking about their ideas. But the truth of the matter is that critical thinking starts with self-awareness. It's the capacity to notice our own biases, to notice our reactions and our triggers while we're examining another perspective. 
because the only way that you can make room to reconsider or to expand your thinking is to be aware of your own defensiveness, your own loyalty to a community, your what's at stake, you know, feeling in that argument. So for me, critical thinking starts with the foundation of self-awareness. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, obviously we're talking about children today, but I think you see that that word trigger is quite important, isn't it? And, and I mentioned the, the politics going on and you, you, you turn on the news and it isn't long before most people get triggered um, when they start talking about these kind of things. Um, Sarah, what, 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 do you, what do you see critical thinking as being? What's your sort of definition for it? I'm I'm so impressed always by Julia. She's um, yeah. so wonderfully articulate in in this respect, and I I really love the fact that she says start with yourself. Yeah. I wonder whether actually as human beings we possibly are critical thinkers, and we get it taught out of us. You know, yeah. if I think of early childhood um, uh, learning, that is where children are investigating and probing and questioning and. They don't have um, yet uh, schemes of thinking. They haven't fallen into patterns of thinking yet. They're observing, they're problem solving. They're, um, I, I, I think the deeper uh, part of all of this is that questioning because they're finding out for the first time. And as we gradually um, develop as, as, as little human beings into more mature human beings we have to by by the very nature of um um cognitive learning we have to group and we have to match and we have to categorize and then we start falling into patterns of behavior mm. um or we have them kind of imposed upon us and and perhaps sometimes within our educational systems we um um we're guilty of um, shaping thinking in ways uh, that are not terribly constructive towards um, uh, environments of debate, yeah. being able to understand that we can disagree with other people, we can disagree with the points that they make and still love them to blazes. Yeah. Um, and then I think the cultural setting is an interesting one there too, where um, in some, not, not necessarily national cultures, but some cultural um, um settings we feel more comfortable with being able to question another person's thinking in order to be able to grow with them rather than um getting stuck with the idea of if i don't agree with you i must not like you um and i think these are really important um aspects of being able to own our own thinking yeah. Yeah. and uh, develop opinions which can then be unpacked and so so that idea of being a little bit um, you know, starting with being self-aware is a really interesting one. How often do we question our own thinking before we start criticizing other people's thinking yeah. in order to be able to make our own opinions clear? Let's. I, I know Julie's referred to it as the feeling of agency as well. I, I, yeah. I, I like that phrase. Sure. Uh, sure. Andrew, what, 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 how would you put it? Yeah, I mean, I, I would echo, I think, um, the excellent comments made by, by both Julie and Sarah. Um, and I would say that if we think about critical thinking, it's really, um, you could look at it almost as a constellation of things because it involves a certain knowledge and understanding, certainly as we get older and maybe in a more academic context. But as I think Julie and Sarah said, fundamentally, it's a disposition because it mm -hmm. does start with that self-awareness, that curiosity that's directed inward and outward, um, willing to to engage, as as Sarah said, you know, to grow together. So I do think that, you know, especially as we start to look at older learners, there might be some formal academic elements in there, but fundamentally it's a personal disposition. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I think those formal academic kind of elements can sometimes be introduced too early. Um, yes. and, and it can sort of turn students off, um, you know, the, the younger they are, the, the more it can turn them off, I think. I mean, Andrew, you and I, you and I work together on, on a kind of definition of, of critical thinking that we wanted to make as applicable as possible to the classroom, right? And, and we kind of came up with um, being able to confront your own biases about the world. Um, and, and that was kind of it. Uh, so it's like the opposite of confirmation bias. And, and, and I, as a theory of knowledge teacher, wanted that to be my students' takeaway after 
their however many years of education and their two years of education with me doing the TOK course. Um, I, I should, I should I, before I carry on, I should actually say TOK means theory of knowledge. I'm sorry if I throw some acronyms in and, and I'm, I'm not going to take for granted. We are all IB educators here and there are lots of people watching, hopefully that are not actually teachers. That would be nice, right? Um, but yeah, that so that was our definition. And that I think was something that the students themselves could, could actually grasp and, and almost use to measure their own progress in becoming critical thinkers. To what extent were they able um, to, to admit that they might have not have something completely right they might they might not be they might not have the full picture and they might be sort of more willing to 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 open themselves up to other people's um views which is what we're doing right yeah. um so what what i mean who, whose responsibility I, I just i'm saying this just as i'm seeing a nice message coming in from someone who is a homeschooler so so hello to to, to you um and that sort of brings me to my next question you know whose responsibility do we think it is um, to hone critical thinking and, and, and train our, our young people to become uh, these hopefully wonderful thinkers and members of the epistemic community. Is it, is it the school where it should happen? Is it parents? Is it both? Are there other places where it should happen? What do we think about that? <laughs> Go on. Go for it, Julie. I, I mean, I absolutely think it starts in the living room, right? Yeah. I, it starts, like Sarah said, before kids are even in school. It starts with the disposition of the parents. So when we think about self-awareness in critical thinking, a lot of times we think politics immediately, yeah. or we think social issues. Yeah. But honestly, it starts with your child dissenting from your authority in the family. So yeah. when a child says something along the lines of, I don't wanna wash my hands before dinner, even though they've done it every day for a year, it's a moment for you to ask, tell me more about that. Yeah. What is it about that hand washing experience that you don't like? Should we investigate it together? Is it the temperature of the water? Is it the fact that it's water? How important is washing hands? Do I even believe germs are real? You know, because your child just watched you pick up a pacifier off the target floor, suck it in your mouth and put it back in a baby's mouth. So when we talk about germs, do we believe it? Now, obviously we can't investigate every dissenting opinion of a two-year-old or an eight-year-old. We have things to get done. But once in a while, if we go down that rabbit hole and we value the dissent of a child or the curiosity or the challenge to what we assume to be true, we start to develop the capacity for critical thinking. It's not the conclusion you draw that is critical thinking. Critical thinking is a process of taking in information, yeah. drawing on your own experience and gathering data to create a tentative idea of what you think for now. It doesn't mean a once for all position that you never move off of. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, you you said it yourself, obviously we can't do that every single time there's a decision to be made, but you know, as you say, once in a while, if you do it once in a while with your own right. kids, they will remember that, right? You know, even if you know 10 times you're saying, please go and wash your hands, because I'm right. you know, but the one time you say, right, well, let's think about that. Why are you not doing it? They will remember that much more than the other occasions, I think. What what do you feel, Andrew, about where where this needs to come from? I mean, yeah, you you yeah. you you come from a slightly different perspective well you're a, you're a parent as well but you, you know you're representing this the kind of role of the school perhaps mostly yeah i mean i think it's, it's a really interesting question because i think underneath the surface a lot of times when we ask whose responsibility is this what we're really asking is who's not responsible for this right. um oh. and so i'd say it's all hands on deck i mean this is not a it's not a zero sum thing whatever setting you're in whatever interactions you have, you know, with young people, I think we all have an important role to play in this. Right. Um, and, you know, that may not consistently happen for every individual and institution that that a learner's in contact with. But, you know, the more the better. This is this is a, a, a birthright that we all have as human beings. Um, yeah. And so I think it's it's just an absolute good and it's something that we can all foster. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm seeing the messages coming in. We, we, we've spoken before. It's nice to sort of get get some feedback from people as they watch this. And Susan, Susan Clevin has just said it's modeled by parents, grandparents, family stories, seen through our actions, our comments and our reactions to others. So very much totally. you say all hands on deck. I like that. I like that phrase. 
I'll I'll jump in here as well, and I like that phrase very much too. I I think there's an element here that um th that it becomes interesting in that I think it's it's quite a culturally sensitive uh, question here too. You know, there there's that lovely question of is is uh, school a reflection of our society or is, is society a reflection of our school if it has, yeah. if it starts in our homes then the next decision is our parents or our carers and in many um, cultural settings uh, the the carers have a very big role to play in the bringing up of a child that may be grandparents that may be a person who's not even um you know related to in the family but then the, the then we send off our little people if we have the fortune to do that to to schools and you know the the um the research suggests that there are still 26 million children in the world who don't have that right. It's not their entitlement yet. Um, and I think, um, so I think, I think, you know, we have to sort of put in that cultural setting as yeah. it were. And then I think it, it, it becomes an interesting uh, kind of discussion about, so what is the purpose of education and our different school systems, of course, have very different views on that. And um, so, for example, I, I have the impression, particularly because I think Julie's brought half the people in the world who've who've read her book uh, to this session today. It's absolutely wonderful to see the kind of comments that are coming in there of, of people who are um, full of praise for the for the influence that Julie's had on them. Um, but for example, in Germany, uh, homeschooling is not allowed. And I'm, I, I live in, and, and work from Germany. Uh, homeschooling is not even allowed. It's not, um, it, 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 it's, it's not legally permissible because the state feels that they need to be protecting children from um, potential situations where the children are not getting an education. And in other countries, um, for example, in the United States, the state is saying, no, we want to protect children from having to be in systems that 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 don't support um uh, their learning. So it it's it's a there's a there's some very interesting sort of aspects here of of the whole sort of equal access uh, to education and and then perhaps also um, once we're sort of into the question of is it schools, is it parents, then there are different approaches towards uh, whether we feel that we need to control as educators control the children's learning and say there are really important things that children need to know and it's in their interest to know them. Mm. And then other systems of uh, more inquiry based, concept based, perhaps uh, approaches where we're saying, well, what's interesting to the child and how do we approach critical thinking from um from very different different philosophies. So just throwing a bit of a, a the, the sociological um, 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 considerations in there, perhaps from from you know the, the possibilities of cultural bias. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sarah, I just wanted to piggyback on that for a moment because I love the way that you articulated the role of schools. I think one of the issues that education as a whole faces is the dialectic or the model that is being used for teaching, which is why having a diversity of influences may be valuable. I know when I read Paulo Freire and Bell Hooks, they were bringing, and you mentioned this uh, in one of our pre-preparation webinars, uh, they were bringing a critique that sometimes the model of education has been so culturally shaped by Western imperialism. We don't always take into account the cultural backgrounds of our students as they come into school, their own traditions, heritages, religious understanding, socioeconomics, and those somehow get subordinated to an agenda. And so part of what I think the homeschooling movement speaks to, but of course I don't expect it to cover the entire world, but is a critique, right? And that's what private schools are about. That's what so much of the education system is facing right now. What is the best model? to give children access because truthfully, homeschooling can be very ideologically driven and very narrow. If we're looking for a wide array of options of voices to listen to and new understandings to gain, we have to deliberately seek those out whether at home or in school, right? They don't just come to us accidentally or automatically, it has to be cultivated. Critical thinking cannot grow in an ideological space. So to create multiple streams of understanding and give students opportunities to engage that 
is everyone's responsibility, as Andrew said. I fully agree with that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, certainly in in the UK, you know, we. I, I mean, I think it's similar similar in the states. I, I know we're we're pretty narrow the the spectres that we that we represent here, but uh, you know, there is a huge political mission behind our education. As a history teacher, you sort of see what they want us to learn. And, you know, for me, it was very healthy to move into the IB system, the International Baccalaureate system, where the one constant was kind of theory of knowledge and critical thinking, which sort of uh, encouraged this very, very healthy um, instinct, as we said, in, in students to question things, even, you know, what they were being taught. And, and I, I, I think that's definitely for the good. Because um, of the systemic bias within our curricula and... Um, yeah. Um, you know, we're struggling with that a little bit in the Western yeah. world, particularly the British American systems where we have so much work to do on that. And yeah. um, perhaps in terms of critical thinking, you know, we struggle with a little bit our own critical thinking as educators. Yeah. I know that for some people, the very idea of decolonizing the curriculum is offensive, mm. um, you know, because there's a real protective element there. But, um, you know, Julie used the word, I know that we've been we, we rounding it around a little bit, but, you know, the imperialistic nature of of the evolution of education in, mm. in, in our two nations <clears throat> um, and how that has been, how that has influenced some of the education systems across the world by the nature of the empire, for right. example, has meant that we have got used to particular patterns of thinking regarding epistemology and um what what is useful knowledge to have what are useful skills to have and we've got a little bit stuck in that through our historical yeah. um, um aspects but i know andrew's going to have something really interesting to say on this <laughs> a lot of a lot of, lot of pressure there a lot of pressure um <laughs> i mean i'm i'm just here really observing and noting that so much of what we're talking about in the context of educational systems circles back to the opening part of our discussion where it really is this this desire to approach your own beliefs and ideas with curiosity and seek out other perspectives as a way of growing. Um, and it, it, it strikes me that that is a, a good thing on an individual level, but it's also a good thing on a systemic level. And I think it probably looks different in different contexts, as Julie said, but there's a certain humility and openness that comes out of that that I think is very powerful and important. Mm. I think this this sort of takes us on to to something else that that we wanted to think about, which was um, and actually someone someone has asked us this question on on the chat. You know, how do we measure success in critical thinking? How do we know whether we have the right kind of strategies in place on a, on a, on a wider kind of level? And and from a sort of teacher's perspective, how do we know if our lessons are designed in the right way? And and from a parent's perspective, you know, how do we know that we're doing the right thing? Um, in terms of encouraging our children to, to think in this in this positive way. Again, who wants to jump in first? Julie, what, what, what do you think about that? Well, I like this idea that we can accurately, rep, excuse me, accurately represent a view to a person who holds it without sort of showing our own hand. So I know that I've really thought my way into someone else's thought world if I can restate their view and not show my either agreement or my dismissal or disagreement. Um, sometimes critical thinking to me is partly narration. It is getting to the place where you can see the interior coherent logic of that view. So even if you don't hold it, you can work your brain around to see, well, given these circumstances, this environment, that background, this is a logical perspective for that person, even if you can find quote unquote holes in the logic, because for each individual human being, when we get behind our own eyes, we have access to every piece of data, every experience, every relationship, every educational moment of our own lives. And so every person holds a, a coherent view. Um, I, I like to joke that the reason we're so interested in true crime isn't because we're trying to develop empathy for the murderer. It's because we're fascinated that given all the factors that could be in that person's life, they believe a better world would be the result of killing someone. Mm. We're fascinated to try and understand how that could be logically mm. coherent for another person. So for me, if we take that, you know, a step back from murder um, to just regular viewpoints, we can start to recognize that for this child in my family, 
what I think makes sense for every other child in the family feels somehow uncomfortable to them. How do I get my mind behind that and around that? Critical thinking then for me is that capacity. It doesn't mean you have to change your mind. And it also doesn't mean you gain empathy. Sometimes you gain deeper horror, right? You study the mm. point of view. And the more you understand the factors that created this outcome, the more horrified you become. But might that also cause you to care about the factors that led to that point of view? And so that's a part of this critical thinking journey. It's getting inside that logic. Yeah, it's not about empathy, right? It's it's no. it's, it's a much deeper sort of process than that. Um, it, it might involve that. It might be that, way, but you know. it isn't always, right, exactly. Sure. I think, I, I mean, that's that's a great comment, Julie, and I think it really brings out a little bit some of the problems that we tend to face, you know, with this idea of measurement. And, you know, given the historical context of, of schools specifically, so much is about standardization and making everything the same for everyone. Mm -hmm. And that leads to, when we, when we say measurement, we tend to think, you know, quantitative measurement. What can be measured on a mass scale with numbers and put on a graph? And the reality is, I think the kind of thinking that Julie's talking about and others are talking about here, it's, it's not so easy to do that with that kind of thinking, but that doesn't mean that it's not measurable. Because I think a lot of times we think, okay, if it's not easy to measure, then it's not real. Um, so I think, you know, it's really more qualitative measurement. It's, mm. you know, I want to see more of this and less situations like that. And that might be a little bit ambiguous and wishy-washy, but I think really, um, you know, that's the reality. Not everything can be reduced to a simple number. Um, and and I think when we talk about measurement, we also have to think about why measurement mm. for what? What is our interest in measuring this? Is mm. it to justify this or, or to take action? Um, so I think there's measurement's a tricky one. Yeah, I mean, I think that's 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 where we have a, a big clash, isn't it, between those of us who who work as um, educators and our kind of political masters who like to have everything measurable and be able to t talk in terms of statistics and, and numbers. And, and it's very hard to do that when it comes to something uh, like critical thinking. I think also that, you know, it's that thing of are we are we measuring what we value or are we valuing what we measure? We have to go back again to um, what, what what we're intending yeah. education to be about. You know, is it about being academically successful? Is it about being culturally competent? Is it about being socially conscious? Is it, you know, um, mm. and 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 what, so so what is the why of the education? And, and I'm just going to throw in here my sort of anecdotal experience as it were and I've always had a real difficulty with measuring um student competencies in school of any sort actually in that um um we 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 have again culturally developed a program of of education where we are assuming and we all buy into the fact that by measuring student learning um, we've learned something about them. Whereas my experience, and you can see it's quite a lot, you know, I mean, uh, my, the, the color of my hair tells it all. Um, <clears throat> my experience has been that very often students who in a school setting have not um, been able to be their best have um, been able to develop because because of the measurement systems that we put in place have actually um, been able to develop as young people and then uh, adults unlearning quite a lot of the experiences that they've had in their in in their school context so you know the, the the danger of league tables i mean how would anybody want to uh, be able to measure critical thinking in an accurate sense values um yeah. identity um mm -hmm cultural and intercultural understanding how do we measure any of those things and yet these are things that we know that we think are really important uh, to develop if we want to live our lives well and to think for ourselves and to serve others so um I don't have any answers as to how we can measure it I have lots of critical questions about how we might measure a lot of our learning it. Mm. I mean, I, th I think you could almost make a case for saying there is a sort of inverse relationship between the quality of your grades and your success in life. Because I've, you know, anecdotally seen so many people 
go on to achieve amazing things having been told that the the you know you are an a grade student you're or sorry you're a, you're a d grade student um it's almost like the skills that they are testing which they then reward with one of those grades are not the kind of skills that can allow you to think laterally and creatively and critically and become a sort of uh, amazing success in both your professional and your personal life i think and we may be totally disadvantaging yeah. students whom we give accolades for. It's not only those who are not achieving in school, yes. but those who are achieving with high grades and really great accolades for their success. Um, and we're actually teaching them a fixed mindset. And yeah. the first time they fail at something is absolutely devastating. So. Yeah. 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 In yeah. fact, one of the things that I wrote about, even in my book, was the multiple choice test conundrum, correct? So you end up with 30 students in a classroom, one teacher, and everyone knows in that test that there is only one right answer per question, and it will be the same right answer for everyone in the class. Mm -hmm. Even if someone comes with a different perspective or set of assumptions, what that does, whether or not we want to argue about the right answer, what that does, though, is it gives the message that there is a right answer that can be found that applies to everyone. It's my theory that the Facebook wars are just PTSD to school. They come in, they see a post, they think, oh, I'll share the fact. And then everyone will agree because, hey, there's only one right answer. And what we've discovered through social media and the Internet is the sources of authority vary community to community, family to family, religion to religion, political party to political party. And so suddenly there is a plethora of answers. We don't all agree and we don't know how to talk about disagreement because yeah. we've only been trained to agree. And so I think part of critical thinking is learning how to disagree, how to have a conversation around difference, not just constantly driving for sameness. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I remember Andrew. Andrew's a brilliant sort of workshop leader. And I remember one of the workshops he led in 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 the school uh, in in Peru, and it was all about positive disagreement um, and how we should welcome the fact that we have dis different opinions and mm. create a structure in which you know it's not uncomfortable to do that, but actually it, it it sort of encourages it, which which I think happens. I mean, Sarah's very conscious of. Of, uh, of of all, all these kind of different cultural perspectives when it comes to these ideas. And I think that's a great one, right? In some cultures, disagreement is very uncomfortable. I think we in the UK really don't like disagreement. We we, we would rather sort of sweep it under the carpet and ignore it and, and you know, mm. stiff up a lip kind of, kind of thing. Whereas somewhere like the Netherlands, I think they're great at disagreement. They're so direct. It's, it's extraordinary. Mm. I, I think probably Germany is more similar to, to the Netherlands than it is the UK, Sarah. I'm on the town council of the town that I work in, and um, it's it's just so interesting how people can sit um, and and um, and hugely disagree within a, a council meeting, and then walk out and go to dinner together afterwards. You know, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's okay. fine to have really completely different opinions about something, but still to be able to respect each other's and uh, and that's very. I, I think I think. Um, um, Erin Meyer's uh, book, the, the Culture Map, is very good at describing that in that, um, exactly as you say, Michael, we have very, very different degrees of directness in the ways that we uh, mm. are able to approach different opinions and a culture of debate. Mm. I want to, I want to, um, sorry, go on, Andrew. Yeah, just to jump in, I mean, something that you, you shared with me that really has resonated with me a lot over the years, and I know this comes from the work of someone else who, who I can't remember right now, but just this idea that, you know, we should be scouts, not soldiers. And so it's, you know, let me engage with, as, as Julie has said, you know, let me make that leap into someone else's perspective so I understand how this fits into their narrative and experiences, which will in turn enrich my perspective instead of, I'm going to just engage with you to show that, again, you're wrong and I'm right, because as, as others have said, you know, there's only one right answer. Yeah, yeah. It was Julia, Julia Garleff who, who said, yeah, the scout mindset rather than the soldier mindset. So she, she okay. encouraged people to become strangers um, when they're looking at, at their own beliefs and other people's beliefs and, and sort of approach it from a completely different um, kind of perspective, which, yeah, I think is a, is a, is a brilliant um, concept and approach. 
Um, I was just going to mention, actually, I, I really like the comment that Winifred um, just just wrote in about how um, you know ch children ch we have this children have a natural ability to question things, and it's lessened as they enter school. Um, and uh, you know, assessments, as 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 we were just saying, sometimes have a yes slash no or right slash wrong uh, kind of answer. And and in TOK, we're almost trying to undo those. Uh, assumptions which I think is 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 definitely chiming with what we say love that um which which kind of uh, you know I, I I would like to sort of dwell on that a little bit further you know do, do we agree then that that young people are kind of natural critical thinkers um that we turn off from being natural critical thinkers um well is is that the case is that really happening there there is uh, data that shows that the natural curiosity that children possess when they enter the classroom by third grade is greatly lessened and by sixth grade is all but extinguished. Uh, and that I think has a lot to do with the sort of testing format of the way education is often delivered. That said, it can be rediscovered. And I think where we see it flourishing the most in the school system is in electives in the arts, in places where the academics are expressed through their creative expression and there's a little bit more freedom and license. Ironically, these are often the school subjects children say are their favorites. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if we could harness some of that, you know, musical theater, wood shop, you know, sports energy in the traditional academics, we would see a recovery of some of that curiosity and imagination. Mm -hmm. To, to what extent do, do you think it's a fear of being wrong? Because that's that's one of the things that, mm. that Robinson always talks about, that, that children go from, you know, enthusiastically putting their hand up and, and, and saying anything that comes into their head to, to quite quickly, actually, when they go into school, being scared that what they're going to say is going to be judged by, by other people. I'll, I'll jump in on that one if I could. Um, yeah. in the, I think it's even before they know how to put the hand up. I think it's before they know how to sit in a circle and make sure they're sitting on their bottom and not and not crawling around. Mm -hmm. It's about um, um, it, it really starts in the early years uh, in that they learn very quickly what what they've said is right or, or wrong after um, having been in perhaps a home situation or a, a other play situations where um, there is not a, there is there is less of a control over whether what the outcome of what they're doing is right or wrong. So that whole exploratory element of play um, gets gets pumped out of us. And so Ken Robinson is I mean that that that's the the, the sort of um, definitive uh, uh, talk was 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 his lovely uh, do skills do schools kill creativity? As soon as we start trying to control somebody else's learning paths, rather than unpack them and nurture them, um, we give the impression that something might be right or wrong. So it starts at a very, very early age, unless we're able to respect play as being a learning tool and it is it, it is an approach to learning and that we're able to um, take a look at what questioning we are um, submitting children to so mm. that by the very nature of the question we are not inhibiting the kind of answers that they might be giving or the kind of questions that they may be following up on so I think um, this is you know this is advocating perhaps for uh, play for inquiry-based learning for uh, developing strategies that for small children we're really respecting their learning journey rather than trying to fit them into a systemic uh, or, or into a system of learning which is actually not necessarily natural to their um, um, very natural cap cap capabilities and dispositions. I like what Heather Oxley has just um, written in. Um, kid, early, very early kids get accustomed to what happens when they ask why Parents may or may not answer. Teachers may have an agenda and move on without dealing with the why. I mean, I I, I think that's a that's a brilliant comment. You know, we, we unfortunately lead the, lead these very busy lives, don't we? Either as parents or as teachers, and we we want to go in a certain direction in a certain place at a certain time, and we don't have time to to deal with the whys, um, and we often don't give them enough attention and 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 a response to that. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to just jump in here with with a, a note of hope as well. I mean, I think we all probably agree that, yes, you know, children are innately curious, certainly as parents, you know, many of us have that experience. And we also have the experience, you know, firsthand as, as learners ourselves or as adults working in education, some of us of how systems that are geared around compliance and uniformity sort of drill that out of you. Um, but I think that it's always still there under the surface, waiting for the right context to come out. Um, Zhao Mehta and some of his colleagues at Harvard University did a really interesting study where they just visited a ton of schools. And, uh, you know, I, I'm probably going to butcher this, but their their conclusions were, were pretty damning. They, they, they said, you know, most of what passes for learning is, is just awful, um, really, even yeah. in, the, in the supposedly good schools or maybe especially in the supposedly good schools. Mm -hmm. But they did find some fantastic learning happening. Where did they find it? They found it on the fringes of the curriculum. So as, as Julie was saying, you know, drama club, in the art room, model UN, sports yep. teams. And it's these spaces that are not really so adult driven. You know, they might be structured a little bit by adults. So it's, you know, a safe and appropriate way for younger people to interact. But there's not an agenda. It's 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 something that students choose. Um, they choose to be there. And I, again, I think that gets the fact that learning fundamentally is a choice. It's not something you can impose on someone else. And I think you know this really highlights some of the challenges of continuing to support uh, critical thinking among learners in the systems that we have in a lot of the world today. But I think it all also highlights that it's always possible. It's always right there under the surface or around the corner. And there's always something that that we can all do um, to, to bring it more into the spotlight. So if we were if we were to offer some some kind of key tips and strategies, um, you know, what 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 would how can we summarize, you know, good practice in terms of encouraging critical thinking in the classroom at home um, in, in in any situation? What do we what do we think about that? I mean, can we I know that's quite that's asking quite a quite a big question. <laughs> I mean, it's enough to write a book about. <laughs> but uh, I will say this. Um, one of the things that I just love that Andrew shared is the idea that learning is a choice. And so is critical thinking. Um, our sort of automatic reactions are more likely to reveal to us our bias and habits of thought, as Sarah said, than um, leading us in that direction. So you almost have to choose against what feels natural to be a critical thinker. And one of the, my favorite ways to do that is to think about adopting these other viewpoints, almost like an actor on the stage. Hmm. One of my favorite things about being a theater student when I was in high school was that I got to be this other person, think all their thoughts, but it didn't attach to me. Nobody was going to blame me for acting the way I did or thinking the way I did while I was that character. And so a lot of times when we're teaching our writing students and brave writers, brave writer, I like to suggest that you take it on like a role. You're imagining yourself within this context. What would be the thoughts that person would have? What would be the sources of authority they would turn to? What would be the community identity that they're loyal to? And mm -hmm. as you do that act, and you choose to keep it separate from yourself. In other words, you're not breaking the family code. You're not betraying your religious community. You're not betraying your political party to adopt that temporarily to feel what it feels like. You know, we could use a little more improv in a social studies class where you actually play act a role. That is a way to get inside without the fear that you are creating havoc in all your relationships. Most of us don't want to examine our beliefs because of a loyalty to someone or some group. And so if we can find ways to examine while setting aside that loyalty momentarily, we go a long ways towards improving our thinking. Yeah, I, I think that's brilliant. I, I, I haven't sort of thought about it um, in, in that sort of way, but yeah, the, the way in which play acting, role playing is critical thinking. Um, mm. And helping us overcome, you know, try before truth, as as people put it. And, and actually, we we had a we had a, a director come in and talk. I, I think Andrew might remember in in um, Newton one time, and I remember asking him what actors are aiming for, and he said very simply, authenticity. So if if you can yes. put yourself into another character and become that character, no, and not not take 
your own perspectives with you you know that's kind of that's that's the aim right that's that's a brilliant kind of thought I I'm gonna I'm gonna add to that one as well because my my background is in theatre as well as education and I've recently been um privileged to uh work with um teachers educators let's say you know a range of people in a couple of conferences where I decided to we, we were looking at community and belonging, we were looking at inclusion, we were thinking about um, bias and unconscious bias, we were thinking about privilege. And these are things which are really interesting to talk about, but it's very difficult to experience. It yeah. is very difficult to understand what it means to be privileged if I'm privileged. I don't notice it. <laughs> I only notice it if I'm not privileged. And I find it difficult and uh, perhaps offensive to being accused of being privileged. Um, if if I don't know what it feels like not to be privileged in that situation. And so we used um, a, a guided improvisation working with these educators. And I had such admiration for their courage because I didn't tell them we were going to do it beforehand. <laughs> but the, the richness of the conversations that came out mm. after the guided improvisation where people had been... Um, um, had had their choice taken away, where they had had um, other values imposed on them, where they were being misunderstood for whatever feature of their um, um, cultural identity was 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 being uh, presented, and the conversations that were able to come out of that, I will never be able to prove. But I would suggest from the conversations we had had in order to develop the trust to be able to, to do the improvisations were rich. They were really um, um, opportunities for people to be able to express what they had felt and then put that into uh, an, a, a more academic framework of thinking. So absolutely. Love that. Andrew, what about you? I mean, what, what's kind of worked for you? In the past, what are you looking for uh, in terms of great strategies that, that that make an impact? Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know my my answers are going to be more biased towards what happens in the formal school setting and at the secondary level. Um, but I'll say, you know, it starts first of all with emotional safety. Um, if we do feel that if if we're wrong or we say the wrong thing, we're going to be looked at differently or somehow get in trouble, you know, no other learning will. Take place. So I think we could yeah. just start there. Um, I think specifically building a culture where we're not so interested in the answer or the outcome or the opinion, but we're interested in the evidence and the chain of thought or the experiences that are behind that. And that's really where the rigor is, and that's where the high expectations are. And with you know, the outcome is almost just an afterthought. I think that mm. that's a, an important step as well. And I'd say finally that something that's a sort of bugbear for me personally is that I think we just don't do enough, especially with older learners, to explain how academic disciplines work. Oh. I mean, I see all the time kids who, you know, can tell you all these facts about biology, but don't really understand how the scientific method works mm. or my own, you know, mathematical education you know, I, I learned how to do math, but I never knew until I was in my 30s, you know, what, what's an axiomatic system? How do mathematicians make meaning? Um, and these things, again, it, it's not just because it makes you a more effective critical thinker, whatever that means, but these are kind of our, our, our birth rates as human beings. You know, these things help us be fully human. And, and unfortunately, um, with the sort of instrumental logic of a lot of school systems, they're just not made available to people. Yeah, and I think there's a gap as well because I don't think it happens in schools. I mean, I think I think I think TOK and and the and the IB go a lot further than than the, the kind of education I had when I was at school in in explaining those processes that, that you're referring to with with science and mathematics. Um, but but for the for most students, I think there's a gap between school and university. You go from just not having that awareness in school to going to university where many of the teachers there assume you already know it. And, and yes. no one's kind of picking up that that sort of uh, that gap. Right. No one's plugging that gap, I should say. No, I completely agree with this. I remember I was a history major in college and, you know, most students in high school think history is boring. I got to college, I found it so exciting because it was exactly what you were talking about. We were being trained to think like a historian. 
And actually the most exciting innovations happening in traditional education are in that exact arena. You know, I have all these books on my shelf about how to incorporate thinking like a historian, thinking like a mathematician, thinking like a scientist into the classroom. And we use it in our work of teaching writing. So I feel like there is a move in that direction and perhaps we just need to accelerate it. And I'm so grateful that TOK exists because that is the kind of thing that I think could really retool or recalculate the outcomes of education. And honestly, it needs to happen everywhere. Homeschooling, private schools. This is this is a different way of thinking. I, I like to say yeah. this. Um, I, I just want to finish with this one thought. We often think we're trying to pick a position and stay there. And then we're going to argue and convert everybody else into our position. Yeah. But wouldn't it be interesting if our goal was to understand as many positions as possible and then create solutions that took as many of those into account as possible? So rather than a conversion strategy, our goal is actually to account for as many unique needs and positions as possible. That changes the way thinking works. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, I think I mentioned to you that that, that I'd just seen a, a really lovely big think video with Sasha Sagan and 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 the title was Tolerating Ambiguity. And she's talking more mm. about science than anything else, but actually can be applied to, to most subjects. Um, and the more I do TOK, the more I realize that a lot of it is about tolerating ambiguity, being comfortable with uncertainty rather than aspiring to a certain uh, view about the world, which we then sort of fit our evidence around to support. Uh, and I think that's a lot to do with, you know, being a critical thinker. I'm really interested in that, Michael, because I think that, you know, in, in society at the moment, with that we have a lot of things to be fearful of and um, um, that are evidently um, compounding in, in ways which um, are really difficult for people's mental health at the moment. And I wonder quite often whether that is about us being uncomfortable with uncertainty. We have so much information that is presented to us yeah. in ways that appear to be certain. Yeah. And we lose our critical thinking if we're flooded with information that seems to be factual and it increases our anxieties because we're not comfortable with that uncertainty. I'm not sure that human beings have ever been certain. Yeah. And yet we're presented in our society at the moment with the idea that it's a very uncertain and a very fearful time. It probably always has been. It's a question of how we deal with that. Are we looking at the problem? Or are we looking at our preferred futures? Absolutely. Mm. That's a, that, that's um, a, a lovely sort of thought there. Um, I also I also have just been spotting this idea lab that um, that people 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 are focusing on, which I I think is great. Seeing the classroom as an idea lab, but you know there's no reason why you can't view the home and 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 your your environment there as an idea lab. And and someone said that's TOK Heather Heather Oxley, who I think is is right now in the Cayman Islands and expecting a hurricane. So I hope you're okay, Heather. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that I agree. That is TOK, right? That is theory of knowledge, mm -hmm. an idea lab in the classroom. Um, so I, I think we are we're getting to to the end of um, we're getting to the end of this discussion. I think we've 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 discussed lots of things which I have massively enjoyed. Um, I um, I would love to see a few more questions maybe come in in the last few minutes that maybe we can we can quickly sort of think about. Uh, if Michael, there there's a question folder that has four questions in it. If oh, you're yeah, at the, the Q and A, let's have a quick yeah. look at that. Um, yeah, um, I mean, some of these I would like to I would like to to put to the to the panel at a later date, and and we'll write it down, and we'll send out a little debrief to everyone. Um, but maybe a question now: Can we develop students' critical thinking skills if we're teaching in a context where censoring the material we teach and the topics we discuss is mandated? Um, well, difficult, I would have thought. Um, <laughs> But but then I, I guess you know as as a, as a teacher myself as a TOK teacher myself then I would maybe focus on the act of censorship rather than the material itself and and maybe sort of think about contexts where maybe sometimes it needs to be censored according to to socioeconomic problems going on I don't know I don't know what I would do with that but I think I would I would focus on the act of censorship and and why it's happening I don't know what what do you what do you think about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say I, I don't think this stuff is 
everything or nothing either. So I think at all of us in our different roles as parents, home educators, educators in the school system, citizens, you know, we all just need to to find the room where we can get it to the point that yeah. we can get it and not let, you know, it perfect be the enemy of good enough, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I, what I've tried to do as a TOK teacher and what you're meant to do as a TOK teacher, which is why I think it's such a wonderful course, is you are not aiming for a judgment, a sort of normative kind of um, a, a, a position. You are focusing much more on the process, which I think is is what we've talked about here. You know, we're not really interested in whether your view is right or wrong on the death penalty or abortion or whatever. We are just interested in how you arrived at that position. And that's where we're, we're happy to stop. Um, so that that's what makes TOK, I think a very kind of agile course that can be applied in lots of different circumstances and contexts. Um, I like this last question here. How do we, oh no, sorry, the, the, there's, one, there's one other here. Yeah, I'm, I'm an Ivy graduate who is now home educating my young children. I find we lose our ability to think critically when we have a time crunch, which we kind of touched on, but I, I wouldn't mind sort of coming back to that. When you have a lot on your plate or a lot of subjects, homework, tasks at hand, it's easier to default to what's comfortable rather than try to tackle the uncomfortable. What? How do you guys deal with that, Julie? I mean, how how did you deal with that as, as someone homeschooling children? You, it, it, there must've been lots of pressure. Uh, yeah. You managed it. It's a disposition. I love that you use that language, Andrew. It's a way of thinking about your whole environment. So when you're watching a movie, not assuming that it's just entertainment, asking interesting questions like, who are we rooting for? How do we know we should be rooting for them? Why wouldn't we root for this other guy? What makes us think this other guy isn't worth being rooted for? To start to raise their aware awareness that they're being influenced all the time and they're making unconscious judgments. So if there are two kids arguing, to be able to actually sit them down like on a therapist's couch and let each child represent their perspective and feed that back to the other child. Again, can't do it every day. But if it's your disposition, you will find opportunities. Once a month is good. <laughs> That's more than most of us are doing it. Yeah. And it is all it is also okay sometimes to want to feel comfortable, Jacqueline. I absolutely <laughs> relate to that. We don't have to be uncomfortable all of the time. No, no, horrible. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a really good question because it's about the practicalities of life, but I completely agree with. Andrew's use of the word uh, discipline and um, discipline disposition and and Julie's um, um, uh, reference to that because it is it's it, it, it's a way of thinking and it's turning it around to what our values are all the time and just bringing it back to okay but what do we really believe about the way that we think and the way that we can think and develop our growth. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, and that's why I think why it's so hard to measure, right? That that's that's why it can't sort of be quantitatively measured. It's it's a qualitative uh, kind of assessment at the end of it, whether we have this disposition or not, um, and whether our whether our students have it. Um, and and yeah, it's it's it, you can't sort of put a percentage on it, I don't think. Okay. Well, Sarah, I, I just wanted to throw in something that Sarah shared in one of our prep meetings too. Yeah. including a variety of perspectives through actually meeting people and knowing them and knowing their experience. We wanted to invite more people to this panel. That's how much it matters. Um, we can't do this alone. A lot of it doesn't come through conversation. It comes through actual experiences and encounters with people. And so creating the conditions that allow us to bump up against other people with curiosity and openness and interest is a really quick way. Travel, living abroad, those things really actually make a difference, don't they? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this up. I've I've massively enjoyed this conversation again, and I think we should have some more of them. Um, so if you've if you've joined us, thank you so much for for being there and just watching us. Thank you for all of the comments, wonderful comments that you've sent us and the questions. <coughs> Excuse me. If you have any. Final questions, you can you can add it to the Q&A right now and we will still see it. I think the webinar chat will disappear in a second when I end the meeting, but the Q&A I can, I can access afterwards. So if you if you do want to add some questions now, you can do so. Um, I, I'm also very happy to field any email questions that you have to, to michael at theoryofknowledge.net. Um, 
just a, a, a final kind of reminder of, of, of everyone here. So, so Julie, once again, um, check out her, her book about raising critical thinkers. Can you flash it again? Uh, sure. <laughs> um, it's, it's a wonderful book, so very, very highly recommended. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Julie. Andrew, thanks a lot for, for, for connecting from Peru. Um, Sarah, thank you very much. We will meet again. Um, we will return and, and do some more of these discussions. So keep an eye out, everyone, please, for, for more of these. Um, we will definitely be talking more about critical thinking and um, how to encourage students to become great critical thinkers. Many thanks. Goodbye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>